Let's open our Bibles today to Isaiah chapter 8. Isaiah chapter 8. We only have a few more chapters left in the portion of Isaiah that we're going to focus on. But here in Isaiah 8, in the first few verses, the first 10 verses, we have to kind of deal with something we looked at two weeks ago. Uh, the idea of who is Emmanuel and how is that any sort of hopeful prophecy for people living at this time? Uh, how is that going to be a sign for them if Jesus isn't going to come for hundreds of years later, how is that a sign that they're going to be very soon, in two years, delivered from their enemies? In 65 years, the enemies won't even have a nation anymore. How does something 700 years into the future give hope right there two years in front of you? Okay. Uh, so we're going to work through that here in Isaiah chapter 8. Uh, we're going to see this idea of a near and far fulfillment of prophecy. So I hope to kind of educate you on how prophecy works. Uh, because sometimes when we think of prophecy, we think just one for one, simple. Virgin will conceive, have a son. Mary conceives, has a son. And that baby's born. I'm taking this out of here. I'm going to knock it out if I'm not careful. Okay. Uh, so sometimes we think prophecy one for one. You know, uh, it says in Micah that... Uh, out of all the cities, Bethlehem, that's where you, the, the Messiah is going to be born. Jesus is born in Bethlehem. But then we have these other prophecies that seem to not really be what the author meant when he said it, and then Matthew will do something different. And we have to figure out what's going on here. Uh, so hopefully, as we work our way through the text today, you'll understand a little bit of how prophecy works uh, rather than just one-on-one, -on -one, sometimes you have this near near and far fulfillment. Uh, so we're going to talk about, uh, we'll start with Maher Shalal Hashbaz. Uh, Maher Shalal Hashbaz. Any of you moms looking for a good uh, name for your baby right now, uh, you know, this is a good one. Uh, I, I had a church secretary who had eight children uh, in my first ministry, and I always suggested names like this. I tried Mephibosheth, I tried Meher Shalel Hashbaz, and she never went for any of it, but uh, that's okay. She had a Jonathan, so. But anyway, Isaiah 8, 1 to 4, let's start with that. Moreover, the Lord said to me, Take a large scroll and write on it with a man's pen concerning... Maher Shalal Hashbaz. So I think here's what they're writing. They're taking a, taking a pen and writing concerning Maher Shalal Hashbaz. Maher Shalal Hashbaz. They're writing the word concerning there too, which is just a Hebrew L. Uh, it's just a small little letter. Uh, so whatever he's writing, he's writing this name with the word concerning in front of it. And here's what he's going to do. And I will take for myself faithful witnesses to record Uriah the priest and Zechariah the son of uh, Jeberechiah there's another one for you moms. then I went to the prophetess and she conceived and bore a son then the Lord said to me call his name Fred no Maher Shalom Hashbaz uh, we could call him M MSHB it kind of sounds like a bank though for before the child shall have knowledge to cry, My mother and my father, the riches of Damascus and the spoil of Samaria will be taken away before the king of Assyria. So Isaiah is told to write on something, and it says take a large scroll. This isn't the normal word for like a scroll that they would read on. This is more something that you would write on something really big, like a piece of wood or something, uh, you know, just a really large skin. So this is like a banner, is what he's told to write on. He's making a sign that uh, is going to be big and visible, uh, 
you know, it's the kind of thing that people are going to see. It's going to be public. And he's writing concerning this Maher Shalal Hashbaz. Okay. Now, what that means is it's, it's a compound word. Uh, that word means quick to the spoil, the prey hurries. Uh, or maybe it says uh, quick to the spoil and quick uh, hurry to the prey. You can't really tell exactly what it means. But the idea is when you have spoil and you have prey, you have one big group that's hunting something smaller, right? Spoil is that which you gain from war. And prey is that which you gain from hunting. So it's saying we're going to put a rush on this idea of your enemies being destroyed. It's going to happen quickly, Judah. It's the kind of thing that uh, is not happening right now with our church elevator. You know, we would like to put a rush on getting this elevator fixed. We're going on a year now, and we have made phone calls after phone calls, and, you know, we, we, we hear, oh, we will talk to you in two weeks, and, and they do, but we also call in two weeks. You know, we're looking to put a rush on it, right? And so God is saying uh, that I'm putting a rush on the conquering of my enemies. Okay? God would take care of them quickly. And he's, so he's putting out this banner that just kind of basically says, put a rush on it. Okay? Be like, we're, you know, talking, you're in the process here at our church, talking about making some signage for the outside uh, for the city to see, because the city is so big on signage. So it would be like if we put a sign out that said, put a rush on it. Everyone would walk by and think, what does that mean? Man, maybe we should have done this. If I were forward thinking, I could have put a sign out that said that, and hey, come in and hear a sermon on Isaiah 8, but I didn't do that. So, uh, But that's what God is doing. Now, it says, write on it, and then verse 2, I will take for myself faithful witnesses to record, Uriah the priest and Zechariah. So Uriah and Zechariah, these two priests, are there as kind of notaries to watch that Isaiah fulfilled his duty of writing this official message from God to the people, put a rush on it. And the reason God calls on these two faithful witnesses, they're faithful in that they are the leadership of Israel. They are the priesthood. They're the ones that you should depend. If, if they're the ones that say, yes, Isaiah did this, then you can trust that he actually did that. But there's a kind of irony in here in that they weren't good priests. Okay? So God wants the leadership to be there to write it. He wants the leadership to be the official witnesses of this prediction that will be a sign of what's to come. And here's why he wants to do that. Because this leadership has already been a failure. If you want to look at 2 Kings with me, uh, if you remember uh, 2 Kings 18, we looked at this a couple weeks ago when we talked about what was it that uh, King Ahaz wanted to trust in. Uh, Ahaz, oops, that's 1 Kings, not 2 Kings. Ahaz wanted to be able to trust in the king of Assyria. He didn't want to seek a sign from God, uh, even when God offered him that sign. And I'm sorry, that should be 2 Kings 16. I thought 18 sounded wrong. 2 Kings 16, verses 10 to 12. So you'll have to correct that in your uh, notes. 2 Kings 16, verse 10, uh, says this. They, and that is the priest, Uriah, they set up for themselves sacred pillars and wooden images on every high hill and every green tree. They burned incense in all those high places like the nations whom the Lord carried away before them, and they did wicked things to provoke the Lord to anger. For they served idols of which the Lord had said to them, You shall not do this thing. Um, these aren't exactly the verses I'm looking for. <laughs> I'm not sure what I missed in the notes, but uh, in the end, what we find is that King Ahaz saw um, 
some, oh no, that, I, I read to you 17, boy, I really, all of you are probably looking, thinking, why didn't you tell me? You're reading 17, not 16, Pastor. Okay, 16, 10, I promise you, this is the verse I want. Uh, 2 Kings 16.10. Now King Ahaz went to Damascus to meet Tiglath-Pileser. Remember, that's Tiglath-Pileser III, king of Assyria, and saw an altar that was at Damascus. And King Ahaz sent to Urijah, and that's the same Uriah in Isaiah. Uh, sometimes they have a J, sometimes not. And the priest, the design of the altar and its pattern according to all its workmanship. Then Uriah, the priest, built an altar according to all that King Ahaz had sent from Damascus. So Uriah, the priest, made it before King Ahaz came back from Damascus. And when the king came back from Damascus, the king saw the altar, and the king approached the altar and made offerings on it. This should send up a ton of red flags because... The altars that the Israelites were to use in worship, the directions for those altars were given in the books of Exodus, in God's law. Ahaz goes to some other nation and sees some altar that he thinks is flashy and cool and says, hey, we need that back here in Judah. So he hires the high priest to make a new altar, a probably flashier altar than what they had in the temple. Not only that, another red flag as you approach the text is you see who gave sacrifices on that altar after it was made. Did Uriah the, pro the priest? No, Ahaz the king. And from God's word, there was always to be a separation between priest and king. The priest was not to sacrifice on the altar, or I'm sorry, the king was not to sacrifice on the altar, the priest was. So Uriah has already been an unfaithful leader in Israel. So God says, I want Uriah and I want this Zechariah to be here to see this message. I want it right in their face. I want that banner shouting at them that God is going to come quickly and make spoil of his enemies and make them pray that scurries away. God says, I want them to know that. Now, that should be a message of hope for those who aren't God's enemies, but when you are Judah living against what God wants, this is actually a message of terror as well. So he calls on these leaders who've been faithless, who've been failures to see that. And, you know, this just gives us a warning. Warning: We have to be careful incorporating the world's means into our ministry. We have to be careful when we are trying to incorporate the world's means into our ministry. We have to ask, what do you mean by that, Pastor? Because, you know, we can go to extremes with this, right? For instance, our singing on Sunday morning. Is it the same exact singing that all the apostles did in the upper room in Acts chapter uh, 2 when the Holy Spirit fell on them? No, it's a different language, it's different instruments. Are we dressed a little differently than they were back then? Yep. You know, they didn't wear it back at that time that I'm sure of. None of them wore ties, so we're all safe with that. But, uh, so back then, it's a lot different. So are we worldly? Have we adopted the world because we're doing things different from the church? No. But it all boils down to really, are you looking at redeeming the good things of culture for God's glory? Or are you look at, looking at feeding your worldly appetites when it comes to worshiping God? What are you looking to do? And there's really a fine line. And it, it, it's a line that can be different for different people. Some people are doing things with the intention of looking like the world. Some people are doing it with the intention of doing things for God's glory. Some people are doing music because it's what they like and what they want. Do you know, I have heard older Christians who like music that might seem superior on the face of it, but they like it because they grew up with it. It was what they grew up with. And you know, sometimes 
Do you ever watch this show? I think it's only on like PBS anymore, and it's really old. The Lawrence Welk Show. Sometimes I will watch the Lawrence Welk Show, and it reminds me of the church I grew up in in the 80s. The music sounds exactly the same. It sounds like a John W. Peterson cantata. Now, that's a really small niche of people who know what John W. Peterson is. It's like GRBC Baptist in the Northeast. Uh, but Lawrence Welk show sounds like John W. Peterson cantatas. Uh, it'd be the great hymnals of faith. I think they're probably in a bookshelf in, the, in some dusty room here in our church. Okay. So there were times that sometimes the church is just behind the world a little bit. But you know, I, I also saw a clip this week of a church, and I'll, I'll leave it unnamed for now. And in their prelude, just to get people in the mood for worship, they started playing uh, Hey Jude by the Beatles. And they just started singing, na, 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 and they're just waving around singing Hey Jude. Okay, And they weren't singing... Uh, maybe it was really clever and the preacher was about to launch into a series on Jude. Uh, I don't know. That, that'd be pretty cool if that's what it was. But no. They know as audience controllers that they'll get people just riled up to sing. And in doing, they'll use the world's means to do that. And then when they switch to some of the Jesus songs, they'll already be in the mood. They'll already be hopping around. And they'll do it by doing things that they like. And you know, there's a vast difference between using the, the instruments, uh, a guitar, a bass, a drum, that the Beatles would use, and even maybe some of the shaggy haircuts, and then using the actual Beatles in your service, all right? There's the difference. One is worldly means. One is just redeeming that which is part of your culture, who you are. If you grew up as a boomer, that's your generation of music, and you want to use that for the Lord, let's do what the psalm says and sing a new song. But if you grew up that generation and you just want to hear the music you like, you don't come to church to hear the golden oldies. Isn't that sad The Beatles are oldies now? You don't come to church to hear that, to have your flesh fed. And Ahaz built an altar that fed his flesh and used Uriah to do that. And so God wants this message just plastered big. Now, I didn't mean to spend so much time on uh, that, but what Isaiah is going to do now is give another reassurance of the fall of Samaria by means of Assyria. So let's look at that. Uh, go down to verse 4. For before the child shall have knowledge to cry, My father and my mother... The riches of Damascus and the spoil of Samaria will be taken away before the king of Assyria. The Lord also spoke to me again, saying, Inasmuch as these people have refused the waters of Shiloa that flow softly and rejoice in Raisin and Remaliah's son, now therefore behold, the Lord brings up over them the waters of the river, strong and mighty, the king of Assyria in all his glory. He will go up over all his channels and go over all his banks. He will pass through Judah. He will overflow and pass over. He will reach up to the neck, and the stretching out of his wings will fill the breadth of your land. O Emmanuel, be shattered, O you people, and be broken in pieces. Give ear, all you from far countries. Gird yourselves, but be broken in pieces. Gird yourselves, but be broken in pieces. Take counsel together, but it will come to nothing. Speak the word, but it will not stand, for God is with us, which is Emmanuel. So Isaiah once again conjures up this idea of Emmanuel, because God is with us, you will be delivered Judah will be delivered from Assyria, but actually Assyria, or it will be delivered from Syria and from Samaria, but uh, Assyria is going to come into you into the mean, in the meantime. But do you notice there's lots of things that sound the same as chapter 7? And we're going to go through all those. 
For one, the, the um, recalling of the name Emmanuel. That's to give them hope. Now let's look at all the things that are the same in chapter 8. Now here's how the sign of Emmanuel works, if you're following along in your notes. Here's how the sign of Emmanuel works. First, God gives a prediction that won't be fulfilled for hundreds of years. Okay? So Isaiah, or remember Ahaz, is facing Assyria. He's shaking like trees in the woods. He's terrified of it. And God says, ask a sign. And Ahaz says, I won't ask a sign, knowing in the back of his head, my, my hope is in Assyria. So God says, ask a sign. Uh, so he said, uh, Ahaz says, no, God says, I will give you a sign. Chapter 7, verses 14 to 16. Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. Curds and honey he shall eat, that he may know to refuse the evil and choose the good. For before the child shall know how to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land that you dread will be forsaken by both her kings. So God said, here's your sign. I'll send Emmanuel to you. That'll be God with us. And before that child is even able to grow up, before the child knows the difference between good and evil, so, you know, a few years, a couple of years, I will destroy those nations. Now, Ahaz could have come back and said, and the nation of uh, Judah could have said, yeah, but, I mean, they don't know this yet, but that's not going to be for 700 years, right? The fulfillment of chapter 7 comes 700 years later. So, what baby is going to be born in a short period of time that gives them any hope? This isn't exactly hope for them. So, what's going on is this miraculous sign guarantees deliverance coming in a short period of time, right? Before the baby knows the good and evil, before the baby, you know, the baby will eat curds and honey. So here now is what Isaiah does on top of this prophecy of Jesus 700 years into the future. Here's what God does. God gives another sign in the present to act as a proof that the future will happen. See, that's the key to all of this, is God gives something in the present that acts as kind of a down payment on what's coming in the future. Here's what's coming in the present, MSHB. Maher Shalel Hashbaz is going to be born, okay? So why is that a sign in the present? Well, because this sign includes elements of the initial sign. Notice the correspondence in chapter 8, verse 3. It says this, Then I went in to the prophetess, she conceived and bore a son. The Lord said to me, Call his name Maher Shalel Hashbaz. Okay. So, a mother conceives a baby. So that happens right here in the 700s BC, so that you can trust 700 years from now, God will take a virgin and she will conceive. The next correspondence you find, a baby boy is born, but before this baby, uh, or a baby boy is born with a meaning-filled name, okay? So this baby doesn't just get the name Fred or John, he gets this big long name because this long name is an assurance that God is going to wipe out his enemies. So just as in the future that baby is going to have a name that means God is with us, so in the present the baby has a name that means God is with us and he's taking care of his enemies. Maher, Shalel, Hashbaz. Okay. So a baby's born with a meaning-filled name in verses 1 and 3 of this passage. In verse 4 also, we see before the baby boy matures significantly, deliverance is promised. Did you see that? For before the child shall have knowledge to cry, my mother and my father. If you go over to chapter 7, in verse 16, it says, For before the child shall know how to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land you dread will be forsaken by her kings. So God takes this present baby and says, Before this baby matures, you will be delivered from these uh, foreign kings, this uh, raisin and pika. 
And then this sign helps them to understand God is with us. And that's why in verse 8, it kind of breaks in. Because it's talking about God coming and conquering the land. And he conquers Judah in the midst of all of that. But in the midst of God conquering Judah, he's conquering her sin and he's delivering Judah. And so it says, the stench, the stretching out of his wings will fill the breadth of your land, O Emmanuel. God is with us when he's doing all of this work. And then in verse 10, it says, take counsel together. It's kind of taunt, taunting the foreign kings. Take counsel, but it will come to nothing, for God is with us. Okay. So this sign helps them understand God is truly with us. But notice, there's nothing miraculous about this near sign. Judah still needs a big miracle to show them God really is with them. There's nothing miraculous about Isaiah going into his wife, it says, and that's a euphemism for they had marital relations. Isaiah goes into his wife, she conceives and bears a son. That's not a miracle like chapter 7 promises, behold, a virgin conceived. There's nothing miraculous in chapter 8. So Israel still has this anticipation of a big miracle to happen. So it kind of builds in you an anticipation of God doing something miraculous. Here's what happens. Hundreds of years later, Jesus is born of a virgin. So then the sign uh, is completely fulfilled in Jesus Christ. So this shows us something about prophecy. Not all prophecy in the Bible is a one-time prediction with a one-time future fulfillment. See how that works? Sometimes God will predict something, and he'll give you just signs along the way that this is happening, that this, these reassurances that his word will stand. And that'll help you when you're dealing with the beginning of Matthew, because like Matthew, for instance, has this, it, it, it speaks of the virgin conceiving and bearing a son, and uh, not only that, it's got some other prophecies. I don't know if you've ever thought of these, but in chapter 2, verse 15 of Matthew, it says this, uh, you remember Jesus was born, and Joseph gets an understanding that Herod's going to kill babies. So where does Joseph take Jesus? Down into where? Egypt. And here's why that happens. Uh, when he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed for Egypt, and was there until the death of Herod, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Out of Egypt I have called my son. Now if you look at that, that's a prophecy from Hosea. You look at that passage, in no way do you think it's talking about something that's going to happen in the future. When you look at that passage in its context, it's clearly just looking at the past. It's Hosea saying, I called my son, that is the nation of Israel, out of Egypt when he was a slave. But Matthew knows that there are times when a prophecy is about a pattern, a way of God working, and he doesn't just give it to you once, he gives it to you multiple times. So yes, God called Israel out of Egypt, but who is the most truest Israel, the, the Israelite of all Israelites, the best Israel ever? Jesus Christ. So God is going to call Jesus Christ out of Egypt, just as he called his original Israel out of Egypt. So sometimes prophecy has this kind of wider lens than we understand. And uh, I just needed to show you that as we work through Isaiah, this uh, first portion here in chapter 8. It uh, just helps us to understand how Isaiah works. Well, now let's uh, go back to Isaiah 8 and start at verse 6 and just go from 6 to 10. Uh, and, you know, we really could have finished there, <laughs> but we're going to plow through because we'll never get through Isaiah if we don't. But... Isaiah verse, chapter 8, verse 6. Inasmuch as these people refuse the waters of Shiloh that flow softly and rejoice in Raisin and in Remaliah's son. So that means the people want to like team up with Raisin and Remaliah. They want to kind of bow to their enemy, right? 
Verse 7, Now therefore, behold, the Lord brings up over them the waters of the river, strong and mighty. Whenever the Bible just says the river, that means the Euphrates River. Okay. Uh, so the river, the king of Assyria and all his glory, he will go up over all its channels and go over all his banks. He will pass through Judah. He will overflow and pass over. He will reach up to the neck, and the stretching out of his wings will fill the breadth of your land. Uh, so I'm just going to stop there and not look at Emmanuel right at the moment. So here's what's going on. Because Judah refused God's sign of comfort, he would destroy them with Assyria, because Assyria was their hope. We keep seeing this in Isaiah, that Isaiah takes that which is your hope and makes that the thing that makes you stumble. That's just a principle in life we find. The thing we take the most hope in at times, if it's anything other than the Lord, can be the thing that trips us up the most. Your greatest strength can be your greatest weakness. But here's what's going on. God offers them, he uses this metaphor here. I offered you the waters of Shiloh that flow softly, but instead you're going to get the waters of the Euphrates River. And here's what he's talking about here. Shiloh is a word that means sent, to send something out. Do you know Shiloh is also another term you find in the Bible, another name for this place is Siloam. Now, have you heard of the waters of Siloam? You have. I'll share with you in a minute where you're probably thinking. Uh, Siloam was fed by, fed by springs in the Gihon region of Jerusalem. This is the lowest part of Jerusalem. Remember, Jerusalem is on a hill. The temple is up the hill. And they would have these, spring, these pools filled by springs. And in these pools, you know, they were gentle flowing springs. Uh, you, you ever get water from a spring? Oh, it's the best water there is. You, know, you go there and it's gently coming out. Uh, there's a spring in, what is that, on 79 Triangle? Yeah, there's a spring in Triangle on 79 as I take Abraham to Bayuka. And it has really good water. Sometimes I'll stop there and get water there. And God said, I offered you these gentle waters of Siloam where you could come and drink refreshing water. And instead you said, no, I don't want that. I want the king of Assyria. So God says, so no more will you get these gentle waters flowing along. You're getting the gushing, overflowing rivers bursting at its banks at every channel. So it's like the difference of, uh, you know, taking, I'll take Isaac and I'll bring him over to the drinking fountain right here, you know, and push the button for him and let him drink, you know, the quiet waters of the drinking fountain. Or I take him over to the Ithaca fire station and I give them the hose and say, all right, boys, let her rip. And, you know, he opens his mouth and I blast him with the hose. Or it's even the difference of, you know, sometimes you get a really good working hose in the summer and you take a drink and, you know, your cheek goes out like blasts like that, you know. You're not taking small sips from your water bottle. Your, your face is getting blasted with water. That's what God is saying, is that you wouldn't trust my gentle help for you, so now I'm turning on the whole fire hose. I'm having the overflowing waters of the Euphrates come and give you this flood. And in fact, this is... Very interesting, but the geography and the climate of the time, uh, all throughout the time of the Bible, the Euphrates River flooded violently. The snow would melt from the mountains and come down and just flood these rivers like crazy in Babylon and Assyria. And when you look at the gods of Babylon and Assyria, they're always these chaotic, wild gods, as opposed to the Nile River, which flooded every year, but at the same time, in the same exact way, it was dependable. And you had the, the, the Egyptian gods all were uh, just very controlling, and their magic in Egypt was all about controlling chaos and bringing order to the world, where Babylon and Assyria are all about chaos and all the gods hating each other and fighting and all this stuff going on. And God says, that's what I'm bringing to you. I'm bringing the rivers of Assyria. Now Jesus uses this pool of uh, Shiloh or Siloam in, later in his ministry. Go to Luke chapter 13. Luke 13, uh, starting in verse 2. 
I think uh, it's no coincidence that Jesus uses this pool on purpose because of the speech that happens right after this. Uh, I'll just start at verse 1. There were present at this, that season some who told Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And Jesus answered and said, Do you suppose that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered such things? I tell you, no, but unless you repent, you will also likewise perish. Or those 18 on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them, there's Siloam, do you think that they were worse sinners than the other men who dwelt in Jerusalem? I tell you, no, but unless you repent, you will also likewise perish. And then he spoke this parable. And here's why I think Jesus is referring to Isaiah. Because look at the parable he speaks. A certain man had a fig tree. He planted in his vineyard. He came seeking fruit from it and found none. And he said uh, to the keeper of his vineyard, Look, for three years I've come seeking fruit, and I found none. Cut it down. Why uh, does it use up the ground? But he answered and said to him, Sir, let it alone this year also until I dig around it and fertilize it. And if it bears fruit, well. But if not, after you can, cut it down. What does that parable sound exactly like? Isaiah chapter 5. So I, Jesus is using all this Isaiah imagery to show the pool of Siloam, it can bring judgment to you if you will not trust God. So Luke chapter 13 verses 2 to 9 uses Siloam negatively. When God comes, if you are against him, if you don't repent, judgment comes. But the other side of the story is that another time in Jesus' life, in John chapter 9 verse 7, God heals Jesus heals a blind man. Verse 6 says, When he had said these things, he spat on the ground, he made clay with his saliva, he anointed the eyes of the blind man with clay, and he said to him, Go, wash in the pool of Siloam, which is translated sent, because it comes from the word shalach, which means to send out. So he went and washed, and he came back seeing. Here's the other thing that Siloam can do. It can heal you. God's coming can bring comfort. It can show that God is with us. So what stands before you today are two roads to Siloam. Are you going to go the judgment way where God comes and brings the curses that come when his presence is near? Or are you going to come today to God and repent before him and say, Show me my sin, Lord. Show me how I can grow. And let me trust in you. If you would come to him that way, you would find the waters of Siloam to be healing, to be giving you sight, to make everything in life understandable, to, to be able to understand and comprehend what God is bringing your way. Is God using Siloam to bring judgment to you or to bring sight to your blind eyes? See, the bottom line, uh, so what we see, sorry, you get judgment or healing, the bottom line is that God gives us assurances to trust Him. Are we willing to believe those assurances? God gives us assurances to trust Him. Are we willing to believe? God had promised back in Isaiah 7, I'm going to destroy my enemies quickly. That's the name. M-S-H-B. Maher Shalel Hashbaz. So God gave that assurance. And the reason he gave that assurance is because another name, Emmanuel, God with us. He gave two babies to give two assurances to the nation of Judah that if they would invite him in, if they would accept his correction, they would understand the presence of God with them. But if they refuse, it'll be like trying to take a sip of water when the banks of the Euphrates are flooding over them. It'll be like a tower of Siloam falling on top of them rather than receive, washing your eyes gently and having sight at the pool of Siloam. So today I encourage you, trust Jesus Christ in his work. Trust God's way in his word. Trust the gentle waters. Jesus says to you, my burden is light, but take it upon you. It's not all easy street, it's not nothing. 
It is a burden, but he is there yoked with you. If you would give up, you would find your life in him. I know I have. It's not because I'm great. That's the thing. I could go before Jesus and admit I'm nothing. I have nothing to offer you, Lord, except my brokenness. And that's what Jesus accepts. So trust him today. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, I thank you for the pool of Siloam and what you offer to us. Lord, I pray that we will accept these gentle waters, that we will receive your forgiveness, that we will trust in your Son, Jesus Christ. We pray that he is exalted over everything. We pray that this message causes people to run to him. In Jesus' name I pray.